Little OKD, little Alina, Elena, I guess Elena. I guess she's Ukrainian, so. Elena Kalitiak Davis. I don't know. I don't know about like Russian language. A little bit of tush on the cover. Mm. It's always nice. Get a fresh piece of nicotine gum here. Start fresh. You're good. Yeah, ma'am. What the fuck are we even doing here? Kaltiak Davis, Kalitiak. Yeah, I say Elena Kalitiak Davis. Kalitiak. I mean, I don't think you have to do like a weird voice when you say it. Kalitiak. Yeah. It <laughs> sounds like to me. Yeah. Uh, and we have the same copy of this, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's only one that I know of. I don't think there were. Yeah. Were there other editions of this? Not that I saw, which is the nice thing about poetry books because nobody buys them, so like the original printing is probably still circulating, but um her second book had uh I think a second printing or at least a second edition of it. Yeah, cuz that's the copy we both have is the second. I have all her books but her most recent book, but I think Copper Canyon put out her stuff. They didn't put out the second book originally, but they put out the second edition of it and then they put yeah. out her third book. And uh, I think her fourth as well that just came out recently, but I don't know for a fact. I haven't wa- I haven't read it. But yeah, we have this. You know what? <coughs> um, what? You know what her fourth book is co- or her newest book is called? Something odes, or ode to something, uh, something like that. Uh, and it came out recently, I think, in like the last couple of years, because in her because uh, the poem she didn't write in other poems, I bought that when it came out, and that was like 2016, something like that. But anyway, uh, we both have the same copy of this. So University of Wisconsin Press, and this was originally put out in 1997. <clears throat> it won the uh, Brittingham Poet Prize in Poetry for her first book, and I think Rita Dove selected it. So we have the same copy. Housekeeping before we forget. Uh, for those that don't know, we do have a subscription plan. You can go... Uh, Patreon.com slash heavy board to receive full uncensored episodes for subscribers only. If you don't want to do that, can't afford it, there are other ways to support us. You can check out our YouTube channels, subscribe, like, share on YouTube. That helps us out, helps the podcast grow. Free way to support us. You could also leave us a five star review on Apple. That helps us out, helps us grow. Uh, and of course, links to everything we cover is in the description. Where do you want to start, so? I guess just general thoughts. What'd you think? I had fun with this one. Um, I probably enjoyed this more than average, more than the average book. I think I had... Uh, I think maybe I'm a little bit... My view is somewhat determined by the fact that I had already read her second book and a lot like her third (laughs) and um, so I already had a very favorable view of her Um, you can really feel that this is like her first book which is like I don't know I feel kind of shitty saying that Um, but again having read her later work I think it's really you can see her beginnings in this book. You can see the um, sort of seeds planted before the next book comes out. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a bad thing to say. I mean, it's very common. Like, you have to start somewhere in that first book. Usually, 
you get like a little bit more of like the younger writer, maybe the overly ambitious, maybe the kind of more failure in some of the stuff because the the skill doesn't quite lead up to the ambition. Not that these are, you know, not that they're bad, right? I mean, most people just to be good enough to get your first right. first book out. But you can see this with all writers. And this is why Sophie and I always encourage on this podcast to listeners, you know, if you can find a cheap copy of like complete works, it's easier for poets because just that the books are shorter. So when you get the complete works, the, you know, big 600 page tome of like a, a poet's complete works or something, if that's ever like a deal, like 20 bucks or under, I'll usually pick it up and just read from usually and usually when they're edited like that there's like they do it in chronological order for books that came out like we did with Merwin and stuff like that listeners can go back like and listen to that but you know you see the growth like when you read somebody's books in order all of them you know I'm reading a lot of John, John Steinbeck right now and I have this collection that Penguin put out of like all his short books and they're like really kind of put in chronological order from when he wrote them and you can see like in his writing like he got really good <laughs> right around after like the first five six years of him putting out books like then he got really good like and then like his books to like went to another level type thing and you see this with a lot of writers you know even really famous writers people are like oh these famous writers it's like yeah well they had like four or five sometimes even more like i think even norman Mailer or somebody had like eight books out or something before he ever broke through uh, Don DeLillo, the same type of thing. Like, you know, you have a couple books before you really get really good and then everybody notices kind of thing. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, also there's a thing in poetry where I feel like first books <coughs> tend to circle around the same few things. And that's also, you could say that of a lot of poetry, but, um, you know, parents dying losing religion getting married <laughs> and like those are those are the big themes and that's not a bad thing you see traces of other things like you said i think uh you know sometimes what happens is like you can see how they aren't quite as tight the poems aren't quite as tight as some of her later poems you also see more like cerulean you know it's not blue it's azure things that I identify as like oh we're a young poet and we really like to say you know it the always, most interesting uh, version of blue the word the word cerulean always makes me think of uh, the devil wears prada uh scene you know what I'm talking about no where she's like uh taking notes at that meeting and she like scoffs while they're putting together the shoot for the magazine and then you know she looks at her and she's like this stuff like kind of thing she's like you you go to your closet and you pull out what this lumpy blue sweater and you don't know that this blue is not turquoise it's not and she goes starts going through blue she's like it's actually cerulean and I think it was in 2003, right? Mark Jacobs did a... And it just goes on yeah, this whole yeah, rant. Yeah. It's a fantastic scene. Um, one of the best scenes in the movie, but that's what it always makes me think of when I hear Cerulean now, the association I have with that phrase. Because it's like a pompous, like really specific thing, I guess is what you're saying, right? Like it's like a very... Well, sort of, but I think like it's just like, oh, I like the way this word feels in my mouth, you know? Like, or it just has to be not just blue. And I think also that's a thing that we do when we're like young poets. It can't be blue. It has to be something specific. <clears throat> yeah. And you'll see this sometimes with younger poets, like a big word that doesn't fit the rest of the piece is shoved in there because I think it's literary or poetic or something or complicated. When in reality, you know, like not that simple is always better, but it just, uh, you know, be mindful of that when you're composing poems and you're starting out. But yeah, for me, I had similar, like, I love uh, Elena. Uh, I have a tattoo on my body from her one book. It's like, I, this book is, yeah, definitely her first. Um, but I was introduced to her with Sophie uh, when, on her second book, Shattered, Shattered Sonnets. Yep. And uh, got really into her and uh, bought all her books and I always say my favorite work that she did was the chapbook she put out in between Shattered Sonnets and um, the poem she didn't write another poem which I would is say again, right now Shattered Sonnets is probably still my favorite 
Yeah, Shattered Sonnets is better than her third book, but then like there was like this in between period. That's why I always bring up the chap book, just because it's like uh It's on the table from which everything has been removed or yeah. neatly removed or it's I don't it's remember. uh on the kitchen table from which everything has been hastily removed. Yeah, okay. Um, are any of those poems, do any of those appear again in the poem she didn't write in other poems? Yeah, a couple of them like do. The, yeah, so that's yeah. like the chat book before the big book. And yeah. poets do that sometimes too, where like, I mean, the big one I think of is like Frank Bedart, who put out music like Dirt that was then part of Starlight. Yeah. But also that chat book, because bo- I remember reading Starlight and thinking like, man, like, this chat book is definitely a book inside this book that doesn't need to be. Like, this is the better book. Um, the chat book was the the thing, Yeah, I thought. Because um, it was just, like, this, like, little book of, like, the tightest poems that then went into this other book, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge Frank Bedart guy. We haven't done Bedart yet on this podcast, but I guess we'll get to it eventually because I do have his... Um Pulitzer Prize winning, you know, collected or oh, whatever. Oh, really? I don't have that. I have, I have like a few of his books. I have Metaphysical Dog. I think that's the last book of his I bought. And then a collection of his earlier work. Yeah, and Bedard, Maybe something else. towards the Maybe end Starlight. of his life, towards the end of his life, he got really obsessed with like the philosophy of making and like crafting and it just started to bore the shit out of me. So I kind of what fell off. What is it? Off. Stardust? Is it Stardust? I don't know. Starlight, star something. Stardust, I think you're right. Um, yeah, I'm not a huge Bedart person either, but there are a few things that I think he does really well, and he's also sort of so far from how I write, I think, or at least in terms of stylistic preferences. Um, yeah. That I I think it's interesting to look at, but I don't know what his more recent work is like or. Well, he's up there now, you know, very old. Yeah, he's old. Uh, but I liked it. I mean, I like this book overall, although, you know, I have some issues with it. I think there's some things in her style that get on my nerves that didn't when I first encountered her. Uh, so I first read the Alina, like, what was that, like 10 years ago now, almost? that we first read her second book yeah. and then this book i think i read for the first time maybe like eight years ago seven years wow. ago yeah i didn't read this book for the first time until right now so this one uh and like sophie said like it's it's it has that promise in it but it does suffer from the kind of young poet mistakes or yeah it's interesting tropes. it is hard to remove i wonder how i would feel about this book without being familiar with her later work because I do like it but I think part of what pushed me through was also that bit of curiosity it's also like just sort of I didn't feel like frustrated reading it which I find I do with a lot of collections of poetry um I mean we've encountered that in other discussions about other poets but um Nothing in this book, even where it's at, it's like kind of, this is going to sound rude, but I want to say messiest, even what, or, you know, you could say in its rawest form, where maybe like it's not quite as tight as it could be, even in its like sort of most haphazard places, there was nothing in it that felt so ungrounded that I felt uh, like frustrated by it. I still wanted to keep moving forward. No, I wasn't there frustrated. Were, yeah. yeah. But it was yeah. long. Like, that's what I kept thinking. There's like oh, 55 poems, I think, in this collection. All of her books are kind of, aren't they? I mean, I know Shattered Sonnets is very long. Um, yeah, but those are all like, since they're broken sonnet form, I guess they just don't feel as long because they're... They don't. There's also the rhythm. There's a really strong rhythm that carries you through. And because uh, she uses a lot of short lines... But yeah, it does. Um, it does fall victim to the kind. Of maybe the maybe that's one of the things I think that is the first book trope, where it's like you're putting your first book together and maybe your first time putting together a book. So you put everything in it, you know, and and kind of you haven't developed that kind of well, I could lose these five or something, you know, cut out these five for the book, things like that. So just little things, little nitpicky things, and then there are a few line break things that I think are um, bad, and then like a little like juvenile. 
uh, aspect to a few. Um, we'll get into why that is or why I think that. Well, there are moments, yeah, or... there are moments of rhyme that stuck out to me where I was like, oh, you know, this feels like the move that I always want to make and know is the wrong move when I reread it. <clears throat> you know, where you have like a, a really hard rhyme in the middle of the poem that feels like it should be ending the poem, but it isn't. It's just rhyming because it was so easy to rhyme or like, you know, it just feels a little too loud right there or something like that. And I don't mind the loudness. I think she has a, a tendency toward rhythm and toward rhyme that is a little bit loud. And I do like that. She also does this thing. Uh, maybe it's just because I have that second book in my mind where we get a first poem that sort of opens with an address. This one less so than the second book, but a few words for the visitor in the parlor. Um, she does that in almost every book where it's almost yeah. like a direct address to the person reading it. Yeah. Wherein and we are assuming that we, the reader, are the visitor in the parlor. Um, yeah, second book we have, Dear Reader. Yeah, there's something similar in that chat book, and I believe there's something similar in that the poem she didn't write, but I, I haven't reread that recently, so I'd have to go back to double check. But yeah, there were just little things, and I said this to Sophie in text messages as we were preparing for this, that kind of, there is an energy to her work that carries a lot of it, like this kind of fierceness to what she does. I think she writes about sex from the female perspective better than any other poet alive right now. Um, I think that there's just this kind of, it, it's kind of like a, yeah, I mean, the best word I can describe it is fierceness. Like there's like a fierceness to it, like a, a fuck you to it, to some extent. A bitchiness. That is, yeah, that is And I want to qualify that. I don't mean bitchiness in any kind of bad way. I think, you know, we think of it that way, but I don't think in the world of poetry, I'm not thinking of bitchiness as a bad thing so much as like a, you know, I think you said a fierceness, um something yeah. uh, something really biting in it i think it's the thing that we're drawn to when we read um ariel by yeah. sylvia plath i think that's what like every girl who picks up that book is like drawn to immediately and but she's even more sexual than plath i mean you know plath had her own issues but i'm glad you brought up plath because i think we need to talk about the confessional mode mm -hmm. um and I have a lot of thoughts on the confessional mode and like what it's done to literature over the last, mm, what, 60 years, 70 years. But like, it's definitely within this framework. My problem with confessional is that it tends to be overemphasized on the confession. And really, my big theory on it is all literature is now confessional. Like, confessional movement never ended. This is what the basis, I think, for autofiction. This is the basis for most fiction in the second half of the 20th century, where it's look at my life, look at my unique perspective, look at these bad things I did, blah, blah, blah. I'm not a caring person. Something that like the Gen X generation of writers, I think, really captured. Um, and then, of course, I think millennials are mostly just stuck on repeat right now in terms of the confessional movement being the driving factor i'm confessing my sins to some extent like um the bad things i did the things i feel bad about or whatever yeah or it was like about breaking down like the eye of the poem right yeah. the speaker who is the speaker um pulling in personal events a situation where we feel yeah the speaker of the poem is really close to the poet if not the poet I, and I do find myself, and I was texting you about this too, I do find myself like having to stop and sort of check myself and be like, am I just inserting her into this? Like, because there was a moment where I was just reading every poem is just like, this is Olena. And I had to sort of place that veil back down and just be like, you are the mysterious like poet speaker and right. try to separate a little bit about of what I know about her from how I'm reading yeah and it's it, I just yeah I mean that's part of the confessional I think it is implied that it's the conf the I is the poet in most of these and most of her work and I think this is what is <clears throat> you know was good for literature when it happened and then is also kind of detrimental to like the whole 
as we constantly go back and repeat what has already been done basically like this kind of like I don't know. I'm just really again. I've I've completely rejected at this point in my life. It may change at some point in the future, but I've just like really rejected the generation before me these last few years, where I've just been like disgusted by Gen X writers. And but that's not true either, because there's a lot that I like. But it's like, <clears throat> yeah, I'm just like, oh god, you guys are still well, doing what they were doing in the '60s. Of. Like you're still doing what everybody was doing in the '60s. Like there's still stuff that's really good, but it's hard yeah. to to sift through because that's a lot of what there is right now. Oh, it's all there is right now. Um, but yeah, I always think the first poem of any collection is interesting as sort of a. Uh, guide on how you will read the rest of the book the themes that you'll come back to the ways that you'll sort of pick it apart um what about that that opening yeah. <coughs> quote i guess the book is dedicated to her parents the oh you mean the opening quote you mean yeah. about um somebody once said to me we must make the same efforts as lost, desperate beings. Believe me, with a handshake, Vincent. Yeah. What do we think? No clue. I don't really make much of it, honestly. I could have taken or like I I could have taken it or left it. Is it from something? It might be. I wouldn't be surprised. We must take. I know yeah. that she refers to Vincent Van Gogh's letters at some point later on in the book, so I was thinking maybe it's from something from that. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I that says that this is a first book to me, or at least screams it's a first book, is that there's a lot of poems that are really on theme for the book and all that, and there's a lot that kind of strike me as hodgepodge tossed in there. So, I mean, you know, it's just a, a common trope of first books type thing. But, yeah. Uh, dedications, nobody cares. Uh, all right, yeah, a few words for the visitor in the parlor. Yeah, I'm not getting anything on this quote. So, something to look up later. Oh, yep, it is Van Gogh. Van Gogh to his brother. Van Gogh. There it is. Very, very Gen X. And there are a lot of appearances of artists throughout. Um, first poem, we get a number of Russian artists, or I think Russian, Pivovarov. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Um, Victor Pivovarov. There's references. Conceptual, conceptual yeah. artist. There's reference to Breton. Um, Dostoevsky does like a few yeah I was just thinking like this first poem sort of the setup we get this uh, recurrence throughout the book of you know this first line every time you wish the sky was something happening to your heart you lose twice um, we get this constant coming back to the sky is something happening to you or not happening to you or um trying to locate I don't know distinguish boundaries between self and surroundings between self and the environment um, but then also like there's this line well there are a few lines and yes my house is a word but my words aren't they words also <laughs> which I think is just sort of one of those moments of where she's being kind of punchy but also genuine yeah I was saying look this is artifice but look isn't this also just this um, and that's probably boiling it down too much but you know even that a return to the idea is like the poem as a structure as a building right um, the stanza is a room yeah so there's a lot of that, and that feels very sort of poet-ish to me. It feels like somebody who's just learned to love poems, but in all of the ways that I like, in all of the same ways that I'm drawn to. Um, and then 
uh, my wedding dress hangs at the end of things. We get that a lot too. A lot about like clothing. Well, there are constant themes of loss in this and not just the death of the mother, which I think is all throughout this, but also the loss of beauty. We've touched on this a little bit throughout things, the aging, particularly how it's, you know, women feel that in a certain way as compared to men. It's a different type of like aging. We've discussed this a little bit in some things, but yeah, not just that, but also intensity, I think. That and we should also say that people that don't know this, <clears throat> of course, we'll have the image out there on our thumbnail and all that. But uh, she's very beautiful. Like she's a she's very a hottie. Be- yeah, she's a very beautiful woman. And I think this came out when she was kind of at the end of her thirties. I think around there, she had to have been like in her thirties at least. Yeah, I think you know, yeah, approaching middle age, and that's. She's... <clears throat> 59 mm-hmm. which now? would make yeah which would make sense because this would be the this end of her came th- out in 97 yeah so like 25 years from now ago yeah. so she was almost 40 when she came out with this book and that's you know that's the time yeah. right that's the time when everybody starts to you start to show your age a little bit more and you know we we talk i mean this is a constant theme with with people with beauty and things like that but there is this kind of loss there there's some loss of religion type of thing here using losing your youthfulness and then there's like the sexual there's kind of like a rawness like a raw sexuality to almost everything she writes i think it's more prominent in some of her later stuff particularly that chat book i think it's one of the most intense kind of like sexual uh you know contemporary books of poetry that chat book um that i've read in the last several decades here uh and and, you know it's from the female perspective too so a a little different when you go through the male perspective but uh i think she writes about it better because she she does it in this way whereas like who's that kind of terrible poet that woman that always writes about sex uh sharon olds her Sharon Olds has a bunch of issues. She does it, but who, I forget her name. It wasn't Sharon Olds. It was somebody less famous than Olds. Oh, really? Is her name Maggie something? Not Maggie Smith. No, 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 not Maggie Smith. I would know that name. Margie or Meg? I don't know what it was. I don't know what it is. Oh, you're going to have my wheels turning now. Yeah, but you know who I'm talking about, right? What's her name? I don't. Uh, yeah, uh, well. Anyway, she writes about it, but she writes about it in this very kind of blunt way. Like, I fuck, you know? Like, but Alina doesn't do that. Yeah, like, Alina does it in a more kind of reserved way that um, just really works, especially for, like, an artful way of showing it. I think that little bit of restraint that we always talk about is very evident instead of her just being like, yeah, I fuck men and I use them and blah, blah. And, like, it's, like, a little, it's much more artistic, I think, is what I'm trying to say. You're talking about the woman who wrote the Barbie poems? Mm, that Denise yeah. Duhamel? No. Oh, is that who that is? No, no I don't think. Or are you talking about Victoria Chang, Barbie no. Chang? Oh, no, I forgot about that one. Uh, yeah, it's none of those people that we just mentioned. We, I, I can't think of the fucking name. So yeah, whatever, we'll find gonna, it. Yeah. Listeners post it if you know what we're talking about because we don't know. Put it, put it underneath there. But yeah. There, there is that. I think that's a good, you know, we give a nice little overview. Pick up a copy, you know, as always, listeners, keep it on your shelf. We recommend buying all of her books. <laughs> Go to Amazon right now and buy all of her books and read them. See what you think. Uh, but yeah, what did you want to touch on? The domesticity, I think that's a big theme. The domestic, yeah. and that's very Plath-like, right? The hating the domesticity. Um, the fear of marriage, the loss of marriage. Not even the fear of marriage so much as the loss of something burning, you know, something more passionate um, in place of the everyday, right? I mean, I guess that's sort of what I see. Are there particular poems that really, I mean, that makes me think of It's Shaped Like a Fork. That's a later poem, though. I feel like some of the poems up front, I would want to go back and read because I don't feel as close to them. I don't they don't feel as tied to this as some of the as like the second half of the book. 
Well, that's one thing I think that is uh, a sign of another first book is that the separation between the sections to me seems arbitrary. Um, and I've noted this is just a trend. I think a lot of poets do sections in books because they're just that's what everybody else does, even if it doesn't call for that. And usually I see it as like a trope more than it, the book needed to be separated into these sections. So you'll see most contemporary poets separate their books into sections. And usually it's difficult for me to see why they do that, other than the fact that it's just a trend in publishing. But yeah, for this is one of those times where I did kind of feel like, you know, why even bother to separate it? It's so long. A lot of these things, like I don't feel the movement between sections. I mean, you can correct me if you felt differently. So what do you think? Um, there were moments where I felt like, oh, you landed on this idea and you started this next section on a similar, a similar place. And she does that with some poems, but yeah, it didn't, it didn't particularly strike me except that as I read the poems felt more like they belong together. Um, I think some of the strongest poems in this are in the last section, yeah. Me too. Yeah. Um, I would say almost all of the strongest poems are the, in the second half of the book. Yeah. One, I mean, what did, I, what, did you mark anything in that first section that you want to hit? There's a few that I marked, but not because I really liked them, but because I thought there were a few issues. But then, um, of course, I have ones that I marked because I thought they were really good and I liked them. Yeah, there are a few that I marked. I mean, I struggled with I'm only now beginning to answer your letter. I've I reread it a few times. What page? Um, that's the first one in the first oh, section. Page seven. But other than that, yet, yeah. And I have read Who Cares About Aperture a few times because I was sort of hung up on that one. Um, the two that I marked as, like, interesting to me were The Outline I Inhabit and Mutilated Versions of My Personality. Write poems, treat me with irony and condescension. Do you want to talk about them? Sure. Which one? The Outline I Inhabit? Yeah, I am curious of, like, what did you think about I'm only not beginning to answer your letter? Because I was really uh, struggling. That first one. Uh, I didn't think much of it, man. Um, I mean, it has a banger first line. Remind me of your affliction. Yeah, there's a lot of banger first lines, I think. She has a lot of good lines, and then sometimes the poems <coughs> are seem to be built around those few good lines, but... Yeah, I mean, I didn't think much of the first couple poems. Like, there, there are great lines there. Yeah, like, talking with you was like opening an empty drawer. Talking talking with you was like empty in an open drawer. Yeah, I guess... There's some... Like, I feel like there's some religious aspect of this poem that I'm missing, or that I'm, like, not familiar with, or that maybe there's just something that's missing here from this poem. Um... I mean, I'm not familiar with stuff about Ukraine or when it happened, but, um, you know, Russian Orthodox is the main religion out there, things like that, which is like a sect of Christianity, uh, rosaries, Jesus, you know, this type of stuff. Um, so I don't know if it was just like if she was Russian Orthodox and then like you kind of lose your religion <clears throat> at some point, right? And that REM song, right? Very Gen X, very Gen X. Losing my religion. That's me in the corner. <laughs> yeah, there are some decent ones. The Weathered House is on Ptarmigan Road. It's like, okay. Um, but, and it like made sense, but it didn't wow me. You know? There was nothing in that poem that I was like, oh yeah, that's the shit. But yeah, I was curious about who cares about Aperture because this is like... I already start to see her do something kind of strange with form. She's really playful with form. And this one emphasizes repetition. Okay. Yeah, that's page 17. Would, what form do you think? I, I didn't nail down a specific form. Yeah. I mean, most of this is free verse. Um, 
she doesn't play with any f- very obvious kind of you know received form or what we would call received form or do you mean like the way she uses the page I was just trying to no I was just thinking about um, if she is playing with a received form of any kind because what she does is she like takes the first several lines right she may be a lover may not it's like walking into a church who cares about aperture about crawl space I sat on the front steps with my arm turned up. And then we get down to the last sort of line of this first section. It's not really sectioned in any way. Um, But the first several lines. And then we get back to she may be a lover, may not. It's like walking into a church. I sat on the front steps with my arms turned up. Who cares about aperture, about crawl space? And so, like, it moves backwards. Yeah. Kind of. Almost like a uh, Villanelle. Yeah, but not at all. Or no, uh, 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 not Pantoom. That's why I was, I kept thinking, but also Pantooms only have that, don't they just have that one line, or is a Pantoom the one that just keeps shifting those? It shifts the uh, same four lines over and over again. Four, lines. four to five, you know, whatever it is. Um, Which you form can, you can do is it one in... that just uses a repeating line? Why can't I think of it? There's one that's just like... But either way, it doesn't... I'm not really concerned with that. I was just sort of curious if that worked here to make... to build meaning for you. Because I really struggled with it. I was intrigued by it. I was interested in it. Um, uh, to there me, it is feels, something. Oh, go on. Well, to me, it feels a little lost. Um, but there's still like you know she's a good writer, so there's still redeeming things to it. Obviously, like we said good lines in this. The repetition is well done, but then it's like it feels like yeah, like maybe it was trying to be more formal and then got lost somewhere. And that's a common theme in her second book, as we've talked about it. But it's like, yeah, I mean could be yeah i think i get the most from the repetition in the last line that isn't a repetition when it's this windy doesn't it seem impossible to grow old um so there there is like this sense of like repetition over and over again and something about like not moving forward not growing old but yeah i don't get much more than that I want to be interested in aperture and crawl space and the idea of maybe a camera lens thinking about aperture, but there's something that feels slightly not anchored here to me, but I I was interested in it. I still really enjoyed reading it. I was curious about it. So even there where it was like, I felt a little ungrounded. I still like kind of had an enjoyable experience of reading which I always find kind of interesting. And I mean, it's the, with the image of the church, like there is this kind of, yeah. I mean, I guess I could speculate traditions or things like that, but yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that for me there's enough there to like really, I would have to, I don't know, read this a bunch more times. But, and even then I don't know I don't know what more there is, again, as if that wasn't my life behind me inside that house, as if those logs were something other than trees. And I was sort of going back to that first poem where we're talking about, like, the space of, I don't know, she hasn't quite defined it yet, but I think what is ultimately going to be her idea of, like, the soul or the self. Yeah, we didn't talk about that at all yet, actually. Um, So the soul, like the kind of theme of the soul. You want to... Yeah, I mean, we get that line. That line does come... I marked it, but it comes, I think... Kind of later in the book. It comes in In Defense of Marriage, page 58. Yeah. Story goes, her body from a bone and her soul out of nothing. What's that's referencing mythology, isn't it? Or no, that's the or is that just the creation myth and Christianity? I just assumed creation myth. Yeah. 
but I was going to ask you about that since you're the Catholic here. Um, well, I mean, not really. But yeah, I mean, I was raised Catholic, so I know a lot about it. Is her body from a bone? Well, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Whereas God made man and then he took Adam's rib to make woman or whatever is the thing. So made from a bone, her body from a bone type thing. I think there's a similar, there's a lot of similar myths to this, like in the Greek mythology and stuff like Probably. that. Probably. Even in Norse mythology, right? You take a bone. I was mostly bone. curious, yeah, about the second part of that though. Cause we know like, okay, the, you know, cause there's also a lot of reference to the ribs throughout this book, right? So, you know, yeah, woman from the rib of the man. Right, that's sort of the basic thing. That's how we get woman. But is the soul accounted for in that story, or is this her like adding? Not sure if that's a direct line from the passage or not, because I haven't really read a real Bible uh, in a long time. I've never read a Bible. Uh, but there are. I mean, there's great poetry in a lot of it. So I probably should read all of it. Um, it is in italics. Body yeah. from a bone. Guess we should have prepared for this. Uh, but yeah, there's that. The reference to the wind makes constant reference, right? The wind. And uh, I'm not sure if she was living in Alaska for this. Now. I think she lived most of her life in the U.S. in Chicago or uh, Detroit, Michigan, somewhere around there. This, her Soul Beneath the Bone, Women's Poetry on Breast Cancer. Paperback, 1436. <laughs> that's what I found. But yeah, I don't know if what, uh, whether that's actually like a biblical line or from anything sort of surrounding Bible literature, but either way, I enjoyed that. I think it makes sort of sense of like trying to okay what does the soul come from? Where do we locate it? Like, especially in this story of religion that we keep coming back to throughout the book. I mean, all, all of the West, references yeah. to her ribs. All of Western as being literature. Like yeah. Something of great import. Right. It's like one of the body parts that we see the most, I feel like, in this book. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, all of Western trying to make them yeah. more meaningful or trying to like locate the soul there or trying to make sense of it. So, yeah, I, I thought that was a, a fun look at something that can be really obnoxious. Right? Anytime you talk about the soul, it's like talking. It's like talking about love. Right. You have to do it really well. <laughs> You have to do it in a way that's interesting or in a way that hasn't quite been done before. Uh, what else did you want to talk about in this the first part? You said I outlined the outline I didn't have it. Oh, you know, this is one of the ones where I thought it was like really tight up front. And then as it went on, I was less certain. When did these numbered sections become a thing? One. Two. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, when or why? Like, yeah. Do we have any idea when this started to become like a trend? I have no idea. I mean, I'm sure there are older poems that have sections, right? I mean, we see. Sections, but I mean, like. Numbered. I mean, like the modern, the modernist poets did this. Yeah. Didn't they? Eliot did this. Um, I'd say in this particular way, I think we got kind of, you know, it became really popular. The one that I always see is like definitions. Yeah. And it'll be like a travelogue or it'll be like definitions of burning and it'll be a bunch of words that have to do with burning that are then like redefined in some poetic way. I see a lot of that and I get kind of bored of that. It can be done really well. Um, I thought this was kind of an interesting take. The outline I inhabit. Again, thinking about not the, just the body, but the soul. How it takes shape or how we sort of locate it. Again, that's really vague. It, it feels to me, talking about like, you know, referring to the soul feels a lot like the way we talk about consciousness in poems. 
it feels easy to make fun of. But I'd be actually more curious to talk about some of, like, the second half of this book. Unless there are any that really stand out to you here. I mean, I think the first section, imagine what pain says, and the ghost-making fog the phone rings. Sure, I'm unnerved, but I listen. I strain for meaning. So when I hang up, everything's sore. When I hang up, I have to write down everything that hurts. Imagine what pain says. We'll keep in touch. Yeah, pain as a character, pain pretty I mean, I guess do you think we get like a an explanation as to the pain here? Cuz the pain does start to disappear after that first section there. At least the, the, at least the reference to it. And then there are yeah, two Yeah, I mean, sections. I think this is the whole entire non-existent conversation that we're referring to, right? Imagine what pain says. Yeah. The phone rings. I'm imagining what pain says. In the ghost-making fog, I lose the outline I inhabit so well. I get so stoned, I have to sit with my imaginary head between my fantastic knees. I get so stoned, I get so stoned, I forget the entire non-existent conversation. Yeah. <clears throat> this one didn't do much for me, but, yeah. And it just feels kind of fun to me. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I get it. It's not like, oh my God, every word in this section of this poem feels like, yes, it has to be there, you know? Well, that and like the two sections where we get two of the entire non-existent conversation in section two and section three. Mm, I don't know. I guess, I don't know what it is that I, that maybe it's this like. Ugh. Oh, you mean section one, section two, how we start how it well, section the same way? Well, section two and section three literally have the same oh, title. They are the same title. I didn't even yeah. realize that. The uh, entire yeah. non-existent conversation. So in the third one, she's giving us the entire non-existent conversation that she right. has. There's this thing, and this is, I think, what gets on my nerves about a lot of Gen X writers, particularly like the kind of like... We're um, being playful. Yeah, this kind of like excruciating scientific detail as humor or things like that like I, I get very impatient when I'm reading things like that so those things like I want to read David Foster Wallace or other maximalist kind of Gen X people that kind of rejected the generation before them right that was writing very minimalist shit in the 70s and 80s but yeah you know uh it does it just grates on my nerves now I used to like it a lot more when I was younger but yeah I think it's the kind of thing that really calls out to us when we're like we're we yeah. want to read everything that's experimental, everything that's new and shiny and interesting. Well, it's not even that. I just mean that like this this non-existent conversation, this kind of level of it's like it's we call it self-awareness, but I think it's like a feigned level of self-awareness because everybody says they want things to be self-aware, but I don't, you know, I really can't. Well, here's stand. the thing, cuz I would argue that she does that really well as a poet, not so much in this poem. Um, but I think worth talking about that she does this thing where I feel like her poems, some of that biting that we talk about, I think become it like happens when she becomes the poem, I guess, becomes self-referential and it can sometimes lift it up from being too melancholy. Oh, the soul, you know? I think that works really well. I think it's something that she does really well in the second book. Like uh, mutilated versions of my personality, write poems, treat me with irony and condescension. We have that moment. And this does feel like a young moment of this. Is this where the poem turns discursive? Is this where the poem refers to its own unmaking? Unmaking here feels vaguely annoying to me. Well, that's a long one. Yeah, this is the poem that feels very much like a precursor to what will become her second book. Because, yes, it might be a long one, but it's got a lot of really short lines. A lot of single, single word stanzas. Yeah. I think the single word stanzas work in this, but the Sean Penn voice uh, threw me, though. When you hear Sean Penn talk, 
Oh god. And, you know, and he's like, I don't know. We'll say soon, soon we'll, we'll all be dead. I mean, I know that's an exaggeration of how he talks, but that's how I hear it when he talks. <clears throat> but yeah, I get he was a big star in 1997. I guess, you know, still a big star now, but his peak. Uh, anything else in this first section? We move on. This was really the only one that I was that interested in. Yeah. Although there are more sort of like uh, experimental things she does in this poem that I don't really like, like when she does prop XX. Yeah. That little bit of, I guess, prose. The more every man endeavors and is able to seek what is useful to him, in other words, to preserve his own being, the more he is, is he endowed with virtue. On the contrary, in proportion, as a man neglects to seek what is useful to him, that is, to preserve his own being, he is wanting in power. Yeah. It's not an idea I have a problem with. It's just like, I don't know why it must be presented in this way in this poem. It feels kind of out of place with the rhythm with, of the rest of the poem. But other than that, you know, I thought it was fun. It's not we get this repetition that starts to sort of help you make sense of it instead of, um, you know, the Sean Penn playing Pessoa in a movie, we get a bird. It's okay. That bird should remind you of something, something troubled. <laughs> a voice will say, don't you worry. A voice, maybe Sean Penn's will say soon, soon we will all be dead. Soon. Soon we will all be dead. Soon. <laughs> Soon we will all be dead. <coughs> Just always think of him and I am Sam. Yeah. But the I am Sam hadn't come out yet in 1997, so. Yeah, all my uh, Tropic Thunder fans will know what's up, right? Never go full retard. Don't believe me, ask Sean Penn. 2001, I am Sam. <laughs> went full retard went home empty handed solid movie oh yeah uh, the one I liked for I guess this is technically the third section if we include those single poems by themselves uh, you know at the, at the beginning and the yeah. end so technically it's the third section but I kept calling it the second and third the one I the one I liked the most in this section was the river twists like Lakeshore Drive and I did notice as it moved into this section that it did become a little bit more sexual. And uh, maybe that's just intentional or maybe that's because like as she was putting this book together, she was becoming into her own voice, which has a lot of undertones of that. That's page uh, 39, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, like those sex-crazed fish drunk on water, racing into my taut, taut net strung out across the river. Like their iridescent scales still littering the river's floor, the way they suck your skin, the way they stick to you, the way they know. You were once a fish, and now you're drunk on air because that's how you feel. That's how foreign. This is the way. We will eat and sleep and talk. Even real people play it. Inuit Adam and Eve probably played it. Alaska is not far enough. Once my friends were pulling me under and I had to swim for my life. Once I looked good standing there. No one could see the inside of my head. Once I had a plan. Once I saw myself as more than myself. As more than just a fish. And just last week the chant of an Eskimo woman, old and ugly and fat with the world. You can always get another man. You can always get another man. The task of it. What I loved was the physical task of it, pulling in something whole and alive and glittering, something weighty and silvery and slick. Once I looked good standing there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great line. Yeah, what do you like about it? Like I said, I think this is the one when I was reading through that I just realized like how sexual it was getting, and it became more explicit, I guess. And then the kind of themes of aging beauty, lost beauty, lost youth, lost faith, lost love, all of that was kind of culminating. And I think this is where the book start, started to kind of really pick up for me. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a solid, tight little poem. Yeah, all the lines work in this pretty well. 
the breaks are pretty uh pretty well paced yeah and i mean like the extended metaphor of having fish racing into your net i mean it's really kind of almost like a basic fish in this like more you know plenty of fish in the sea kind of image <laughs> but it works really well something weighty and silvery and slick but she's talking about the game right the game between the sexes catching things yeah. in her taut taut net yeah it could also be her vagina well not that it's her vagina but like just the metaphor itself like catching it's fish. her vagina no i'm just joking well that too and that's why i got like the kind of like um i think it could be though we're talking about creation adam and eve the theme that kept coming up i mean it all is and it isn't yeah. right if it could be it is what's the saying everything's everything's about sex except sex that's about power yeah. i don't know who said that i forget but you know famous quote well that's also like a good summary of this poem yeah well just this idea of like the game, right? The task of it. What I loved was the physical task of it. The casting your net and catching something. Pulling in something whole and alive and glittering. Yeah. It's a power thing. And not necessarily I mean, the I actual it... act of sex. I don't want to go that literal with the metaphor. Yeah. But I want to talk. But like it is, you know, talking about something bigger than just the act of, you know, putting a penis in a vagina or whatever. It's literally yeah. the act of. You know, and it, this is what I mean by, like, the female perspective of sex. There's, like, this fishing, not, like, fishing element to it, but it's, like, uh, the things that men and women get out of it are different kind of thing. Yeah, they can be. And the idea of, we've talked about this a little bit on other episodes, the female desire to be desired yeah kind of thing it's the sex before the sex yes like that's what i that's mean that's where the real sex yeah. is <laughs> but only for women <laughs> like yeah like yeah. yeah that's the difference right there it's yeah. twilight it's twilight but it's like not tween you know it's like a real yeah. world adult woman yeah like this is somebody who's lived in the world many sexual partners experienced a lot of that married divorced you know kids gave birth all that kind of stuff so not just like some young girl who like likes the boys talking to her getting attention it's like a little bit deeper i don't know i just thought this was like simple enough and that's one thing i do like about her is that she's she's usually pretty simple uh, and I think that's usually where the best poems get. I mean, not always, right? You know, some masters can really get complicated with it. It's very interesting and good. But, like, you know, most people don't need to get that complicated. Like, if you have something to say like this, you know, if the river twists like Lakeshore Drive. I'm assuming Lakeshore Drive, she's referring to the city in Chicago, this street in Chicago. Where I lived in Louisiana, there was a Lakeshore Drive, too. Like, anywhere where there's a lake, right? There's, like, a Lakeshore Drive that kind of goes... Up around the lake and it curves around the kind of lake and the city and all that mm -hmm. uh yeah yeah i mean i think it kind of continues in angels and moths where's that on the next oh, page next it's the next page wasn't as big on this one and i think it's because the moth kind of got made it get a little bit lost but what did you think yeah i was just interested in it as sort of maybe looking at the chase from another angle and not so much the chase but like the aftermath um but sometimes i feel someone remembering me that way translucent crazy awake only at night so here we're referring to a moth He's regretting his fingertips were not wide or soft enough. He's mourning me now. He's imagining me eating away at someone else's light. And that's perfect. That's exactly how he always wanted to love me. My wings, my hair like antennae, hanging. My frenulum between his forefinger and his thumb. Yeah, it's not quite as, um, I don't know direct in its metaphor but yeah just the idea of being wanted i think is like what it's getting at and that's perfect <laughs> she says she wants to be remembered this way as this like desirable interesting thing 
or so it seems but also as something that he can hold. Yeah, the moth thing, I don't really understand. Something small and delicate. But I just probably don't know enough about moths. I mean, I think the only important thing about moths that we get in this poem is that they're attracted to light, they come out at night, yeah. and they have delicate wings. I think that works here. Uh, anything else you wanted to get out of section two? I just had that one. Or section three, rather, sorry. Technically. No, not really. I mean, I think... All right, well, then you want to hit the next section. Ovarian tree. What page does it start on? Uh, this next section starts on page 64. Oh, I think also, before we do that, page 46, I would just say also, I think, like, this is a little poem that I feel like also gives you some insight on how to understand and like sort of read the poems and read this book even if you just look at this first section or this first stanza this house is a mess full of solid notions that keep turning into objects the simple sadness that's shaped like a fork I mean it's also kind of hilarious this simple sadness that's shaped like a fork <laughs> it feels kind of bitchy but I think also that idea, these solid notions that keep turning into objects. I think that's kind of, I don't know. That's also a lot of what metaphors do, but I think that's a good thing to have in mind as you good thing to have in mind like as you're reading. Well, this is one I think that's like a very much of the domestic. Turning the soul into objects, too. It is very much of the domestic. With like the Sylvia Plath influence or just, again, I mean, a lot of people have adapted this as their personality. But still, like this kind of like, yeah, it's shaped like a fork. And, and the vague fear that crusts, over, crusts these dishes, I'm vacuuming over the grass like pain. Yeah vacuuming uh and then they get to the wash folding there's like these metaphors in this and then the kind of family dinners so emptying pockets for the wash such a burden not just wrappers but keys and mints those sticky and sorrow coated stones and this larger grief that always needs to be folded all day i've been chewing on my own acrid gloom trying to put away the things you keep carrying home from work, the possessions of children and women and drunks stolen or cheated, the tasteless unhappiness of others into jars labeled heartbreak, injustice, just plain bad fucking luck. Yeah, I think that's a pretty, you know, straightforward one, right? Yeah, I think it's straightforward in two stanzas um, and uh, only a few sentences. I think it's really only three sentences total, four as I'm counting them up here but that last stanza is a complete one sentence on its own yeah it's literally just also turning um, abstractions into objects like what do you mean I mean that's sort of how she starts out right solid notions that keep turning into objects and then she demonstrates that for the rest of the poem and I think she does this elsewhere in the book just without announcing it. This larger grief that always needs to be folded. Like, you know, obviously we think of like laundry. Yeah. Right? We've already established laundry here. Yeah, emptying pockets for the wash. In the sentence before. But yeah. Just a good little poem. It's not one that like rips me up. It's not one that like tears me a new asshole. It's just a good little poem. Yeah. yeah then we have what I'm assuming is a mother poem in first stone. Yeah. Are there any that <coughs> speak to you in this one? There aren't. There's only like one poem that I mean, I think we both had the same idea about what our favorite poem in this book is. Yeah. Um, I really didn't have much else in this section, but the next section I did have, um, what did I mark here? Uh, this next section, the technically fourth section, it gets a little bit more 
I think, into what her style was in the second book and then kind of continued through her other books here. But in this section, the fourth section, technically, uh, Postcard is the one that I think is the best poem in this book. But there are also, I think, just interesting things that were done in this section with um, where you could just see her experimenting. Like, uh, I've always been one to delight in the misfortunes of others. And that's like, mm-hmm. you know, mostly italicized. I don't know what's happening there. I think it doesn't work quite as well with the italics, but um, at least she's trying it, right? And this is the only poem to really have it. There's a lot of great lines in that one, like kerosene. And the first line is, yes, it's daily. <laughs> That's a very good one. Um, Seasonal dwelling, I didn't really like that much just because it rubbed me the wrong way. But, yeah. Is this the longest section? It might be. Yes, it's daily that we move into each other. But this morning, I was separate even from myself. That's another common theme throughout this book. Get that in the very first line of the book. Every time you wish the sky was something happening to you, you lose twice. Or you wish the sky was something happening to your heart, I guess. Um, Today the sky was white and the ground was white too, yet I could tell them apart. They were that easy to distinguish. Right? There is something about distinguishing self from sky, self from self, the sky from ground. So it takes me back there. Yeah, there were other moments that you were interested well, the one a seasonal dwelling on page 67, I think is a good example of what I didn't work for me in the book. At least that's how I marked it where, mm-hmm. you know, that starts the thinking soul is conducting an experiment. Yeah. Already. Yeah, it's kind of turning of me of off. Investigation. As soon as you have felt something, throw it away. She has discarded several large cities. There are porches she refuses to return to. Rivers and dresses already seen through. Rows of almond trees, bridges. She has never seen the southern plains, has never dived for memories in a, into a swimming hole or an ocean. Tomorrow night she hopes to be lifted once again by painfully clear sky, to be disappointed once again by the aurora borealis. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel you on that one. Yeah, this one I think just exemplifies things that I think weren't working, whereas again, this kind of, again, it's just me personally, this very Gen X kind of to be disappointed once again by Aurora Borealis. This idea that was kind of inherited (coughs) by our generation where like, you know, beautiful things suck. I fucking want to see the Aurora Borealis. Yeah, exactly. Most people do. But it's Grand. unique we and also cool, know. and I'm a pick-me art girl if I think Aurora Borealis sucks kind of thing. You know what I mean? But also, like, I live in Alaska. Right, so you see it all the time if you live in Alaska there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she does live in Alaska, so there is mm-hmm. that. Yeah. But, yeah, we know what Aurora Borealis is, and then, like, yeah, this kind of, like, oh, like throw it away feeling something being afraid i don't know it just strikes me as tired now maybe it wasn't in 1997 but yeah i mean it probably wasn't i just reject this a lot i reject a lot of this kind of this this fiend or like faked apathy by the previous generation of american writers yeah i don't even think that with her though it's apathy i get what you mean that's what I mean. I don't think it's apathy. Um, yeah. I think it's self-pity. I do think, like, <laughs> or, like, later, I think, well, I think it's, like... Um, and you see a lot of people do this. I see a lot of Gen X writers do this. Uh, Brett Easton Ellis might be the worst offender on this, I think, from what I've read. Which is, I don't care. I don't care about anything. Don't you understand? I'm cooler than every you know, kind of thing. And it just gets on my nerves. Yeah, I don't think that line is great to be disappointed once again by the Aurora Borealis. I don't think. Yeah, I get it. That's what I mean. It's there for aesthetic and not so much for, you know, it's there for the shock value. I'm bored by this beautiful thing. And I get it, right? Like, this is something Plath would do. Um, 
this is something a lot of great writers have done. Uh, you know, Berryman, great literature bores me, you know. You think Plath did that? I don't know. Like the sentiment of it. So the I difference think is Plath's when, poems end in bangers all the time. Yeah, well that's the difference is Plath was the first one to do you know, so Plath was the innovator and then everybody's copying but, her. And she but she was like fiery and bitchy yeah. <laughs> in the endings of her poems this just feels more like disappointed once again you know like it's kind of more it feels more sullen and less bitchy and like i don't know yeah maybe a little played out i mean again we're reading a book that's from 1997 so when we say played out Right. Might not have been then. Oh, literally 25th anniversary here. Reading it now. But also, like, what is this poem trying to say? And not in the, you know, I, I'm sure I've said it enough. It doesn't have to be, like, the single concrete thing. As soon as you have felt something, throw it away. I've discarded all of these things, these several large cities. I've discarded these porches that I will not return to. I've discarded... But even there are things that I have not felt that I have yet to discard. I have never dived for memories into a swimming hole or an ocean. I hope again to be lifted by a painfully clear sky. And I am disappointed by the Aurora Borealis. And what's the idea here? And now I'm going to throw that feeling away. And this is what I think is the juvenile aspect to this first book here is that it is this kind of thing that I think a lot, I, mean, I guess it started in the Gen X generation and our, you know, our generation does this a lot too. And then I'm sure the generation after us is doing it as well. It's the sentiment. It's this kind of like, and I don't mean to pick on this poem, you know, I'm talking more generally now, but it's like this sentiment of I'm bored and that makes me unique and that makes me a great artist and type thing. You know what I mean? It's this sentiment of, <clears throat> you know, I'm bored while reading Shakespeare, Shakespeare, therefore Shakespeare sucks. It definitely isn't me. That's the problem. You know, all this kind of stuff. Like it's, I don't know. It just gets under my skin. I, I just really, every time I see like apathy as an artistic ethos, it just really well, bothers me. The thing I kept thinking of by comparison to this poem was um, one art. What are the lines? I've, I've lost cities. Um, but I think maybe, like, I feel like there's something logical that this poem wants to say that I'm not quite, quite getting. Well, the thing is, um, is that I think it's there. It's just very base level, you know, an inch deep is where that apathy comes from. And that's why I think it's a younger artist trope. Yeah, I mean, but I very much get, like, a and sense it's of, easy. Like, we just read one art for the first time. Lose something every day, except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names, and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. you think this is why did I mean, you, why I, did you? do I think this is what well, well, I just why did you bring up one art again I mean because I think it it expresses similar ideas in a more artful way or in a clearer way I think it's like talking about it like it's almost like it's taking that idea instead of losing it says throw it away it feels throw like it, the same idea. Throw it away because I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. I'm artist. Yeah, I don't know. It was just something interesting. Like I could not think art of that ho. poem while I was. Yeah. I could not think of that poem while I was reading. <clears throat> yeah, and like I said, I don't mean to pick on this poem, but I just mean like the overall thing that kind of turned me off from this going back and reading it as I'm older is the kind of juvenile aspect. And again, it's a very much that generational, that kind of like small generation that started grunge and just hated everything, right? Everything sucks. Well, yeah, we all have this. So we all have this from like in our 20s, in our teens, in our 20s. That's what I mean. Yeah, it's a teenage kind of idea of what an artist is or what art is or that that makes you unique in some way. 
doesn't have to be teenage, just like young enough or new enough. Sure. Right? Just new enough to poetry or young enough to have that sort of intensity. Yeah. Oh, the soul. Yeah. I, I, I feel the same way when I read like, you know, like the, the, the Don DeLillo stuff and all that everybody praises when I read that. I'm the, the irony. Oh, well, that's just like the whole... Well, the humor yeah. and irony, like that ironic humor that Gen X loves to the do. Irony and the, I don't need to have a plot. And I get DeLillo isn't necessarily Gen X, but like he was publishing at that time and was like a big influence. You know, it just is lost on me. It's not funny anymore. The humor doesn't hold up to me kind of thing. You know what I mean? The ridiculousness that it's like is, is, is easy. It's an easy way to call yourself profound and maybe that's what, it, like I said, it's, I think it's just a personal issue I have, like my personal cynicism with the art right now. But that's just, you know, what I'm thinking of recently when I'm reading a lot of these, you know, as, as the Gen X writers are kind of aging out and our generation is getting this kind of turn, I'm noticing more and more. And maybe I'm just reading more, better, wider, you know, more educated. Uh, but yeah, we'll move on from this one. Uh, what what else did you want to cover in this section besides postcard, or if anything besides postcard? Because I know we want to talk about postcard, but anything before that? Because that's kind of right at the end of this section. Yeah, I mean that's really. I felt not especially. Um... Not as convinced as I wanted to be by the last poems. In this section or the book? Yeah. and Well, in the book. is I mean, this is in the book, right? Like, this yeah. is the last section, or there's one more. There's one more where there's a poem by itself. Where so it's like a the, single poem. Yeah, just like the beginning. Yeah. So it's, I guess that's technically like the fifth section is that single poem, but it's, you know, it's only one poem. So yeah. it's a little confusing if we're calling it a section, but technically it is in the book. So that's what we'll say. Listeners can uh, argue about our semantics later. Yeah, you said you didn't like the last couple? I think the last poem wasn't as good as something like Postcard. But, um, I, like I said, I think in this last section you did see that kind of young or, you know, first book writer, poet, start to blossom. And I think that's why, like, you know, this is why we always say read complete works. Buy all their books and read them all in order. And just, what do you think? What do you think of their growth? Where do you think the changes occurred? Were they into something new? Did they grow? Change styles? Um, little quirks that like were you're doing when you're younger because you're copying people you like, and then eventually you grow out of that, or you make it your own. You know, like all these different things that can make you that we look for when we're talking about an artist's career <clears throat> and like their body of work. Yeah, I mean, I'm just like kind of being a bitch, and I'm really turned off by these first couple lines. Like, oh. even though it's totally. Which poem? You know, uh, the la very last the poem. Last one? There may be more of this world than can possibly exist. Not just the cosmos you have thickly sown into the small field just east of your heart, but all that is held in disbelief, in unfaith. I like the idea. I, for whatever reason, I'm just like irked by the presentation. I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm too close to it. Maybe I'm just in a bitchy mood. I do think this is a book I will read again and probably feel closer to. That's right. This is your first time reading it. I forget. Later. I keep forgetting. But yeah, I mean, I think that one is the reason I felt a little let down by this last one. One, because it's by itself on its own section. And I don't know if that's needed at all because it separates it from the rest of the poems. So it's like adding a certain emphasis, you know, by doing that in the structure of the book. But then it, I think by this point when we've read, you know, over 90 pages of poems around the same themes, by the time we get to this one, it's kind of the same themes, and it's just separated off by this structure that seems a little bit ar arbitrary to me. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like... We just kind of get a little sick of it, I think, you know, uh, you know, but what's left of the salt lick of your soul or of the woman you married kind of thing. And, you know, I don't like getting into the biography and stuff like that because we pretend that that's analysis, but... I guess it's important for context, but then I'm also just like, yeah, well, like, you know, at a certain point, context is doesn't do much. You know, you can get all the context in the world, but what really matters is the poem in front of you, you know, or the work in front of you. But yeah, it's just, I don't know when she got divorced, um, but that's all over shattered sonnets and things like that. Uh, maybe it was starting to happen here. Yeah. 
I mean, the sort of layout of the poem, the not just this, but this, and also this. It's essentially a list, and it's mostly, I think, sort of um, built like that. I think it's sort of split up into those sections for the most part with some minor exceptions. Yeah. And I think this one has the line variations don't work as well as it does in other places in the book. And that throws me a little bit. All those quiet hours when you thought you knew what you were talking about, but you were only scrubbing your soul with salt, saying, let what is grain turn to grain, just not meaning it. Let what is grain turn to grain. Do you make something of that? I think I was thinking maybe something about um, let these objects be themselves, not the soul. Let what is grain turn to grain. My soul is grain. Like I was sort of following. <laughs> I was trying to follow all these threads in my head. But I'm not nailed down in any one specific way. Well, like kind of like it is what it is type saying, like let yeah. what is grain turn to grain. Uh, just not meaning it is how I read it. Okay, just curious. Not that we have to nail it down in any one way, but since it's the last line of the book, I'm always interested to see if we can make sense of it. Do you want to hit postcard? Yeah. Let's hit postcard. Lately, so, I am capable only of small things. Sorry, you want to talk first? No, you can go on. Read it. Lately, I am capable only of small things. Is it enough to feel the heart swimming? Jim is fine. Our first garden is thick with spinach and white radish. Strangely, it is summer, but also winter and fall. In response to your asking, I fill the hours, then lick them shut. Today, not a single word, but the birds quietly nodding as if someone had suggested moving on. What was that perfect thing someone who once believed in God said? Please don't misunderstand. We still suffer, but we are happy. Yeah, I think this is the one that uh, probably the strongest in the entire book. And it's ironically one of the simplest, too. Yeah. And it gets with the themes, is it enough to feel the heart swimming kind of thing? Um, and I think there's this thing to getting older that is captured, right? Whereas we get very excited over things when we're young, and then when we're older, we think that it's... Um, you want to recapture that intensity, right? <clears throat> you yeah. see this a lot in relationships and things like that too, right? You have that puppy love in the beginning, that kind of infatuation, and that kind of feeling in your gut, that burning desire fades away. Is it enough to feel the heart swimming, right? Is it yeah, enough? well, I mean, I would ask as opposed to what? What do you mean? Swimming as opposed to what? Should there be an opposition here? Swimming as opposed to drowning? Or like, just is it enough to feel the heart swimming as though the heart swimming is some indication of, I don't know, big feeling? Yeah. That's what I would say. I mean, is it enough to feel the heart swimming? Jim is fine. I think that is something that she also gets really good at in the next book. And you sort of see the beginnings of that here, where we go from this sort of romantic phrasing to, yeah, Jim's fine. Something very conversational. Well, lately I'm capable only of small things, and then it is enough to, f is it enough to feel the heart swimming, you know, small thing, or yeah. like, basically that you don't have to be doing anything or capable of that, or like, but you know, is it enough to feel But also, swimming? yeah, Jim is fine, doesn't, <laughs> Jim is fine, doesn't really express some great passion, right? Is it enough to feel the heart swimming? Jim's fine. Like, there isn't something specific that's igniting some passion. There isn't some fiery romance. We have this garden. It's 
thick with radishes. It's springtime, things are growing, but also it is winter and fall. I take that to mean we are in the later years or the end of something. Yeah. And also, though, when you live in weird places like Alaska or yeah. out, out where I live, where, like, strangely it is summer, but also winter and fall, you, if you took it literally, like, there are weird weather patterns mm -hmm. in places where you have a lot of mountains that change the weather, like, literally in the same day. It could just drop temperature all of a sudden because the covers of the sun or, you know, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, and then you also take it in the more metaphorical way, summer, but also winter and fall, this kind of, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why I was reading it as like spring before, but yeah, it's summer, things are growing. I was thinking spinach and white radish, aren't those winter vegetables? That makes sense, probably. The winter of our discontent. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you could definitely, I could see that as a literal thing. But I think also when it works well, it does, it can do both. In response to your asking, I fill the hours, then lick them shut. So a little bit of an allusion again, back to postcard or an envelope or a letter or, of course, poetry. Right. Today, not a single word, but the birds quietly nodding. So yeah, this kind of, to me, goes back to, is it enough to feel the heart swimming? There isn't, like, some great passionate thing that's pulling you in. Today, not a single word. So again, I fill the hours, then lick them shut. We're thinking envelope. We're thinking letter. We're thinking writing. Today, not a single word from anyone, including possibly yourself. But the birds quietly nodding. Anytime I have birds, I think poetry, I think song. She refers to birds um, in the context of herself, or the speaker refers to birds in the context of herself throughout the book. As if someone had suggested moving on, quietly nodding as if someone had suggested moving on. What was that perfect thing? Someone who once believed in God said, please don't misunderstand. We still suffer, but we are happy. Right. It's I, I think there's something really effective here that plays with that in between space. We're not bad. We're not amazing. We're good. We're yeah, fine. I mean, <clears throat> it definitely sing sing single like like you said, the end of things. And it that feels... has its own kind of um loss. Yeah, I mean, it feels like a breakup poem or a death poem or like, um, again, this kind of, I, I believe it's, I'm, this is a theory I have, but I mean, I believe this, to, I mean, again, if this is about death, it's one thing, if it's about breaking up, it's another. There's a fantasy that most of us have in our heads, right, about how life is supposed to go or how we wish it would go. And then there's the reality. And then when that fantasy and reality diverge, we believe that it's because of something in our life or we put it onto somebody else in our life. Um, and I just think that's like a learned kind of like, well, it's not like I wanted it to be, therefore it's miserable or we're suffering. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think if we're at the end of something, I wouldn't even say it's like, it feels like a breakup poem so much as it feels like a, we are no longer in the young, passionate phase of life kind of poem. We have to move forward and we don't know how. Yeah. Except to fill the hours and lick them shut, you know? And I think that is, it's a really tight little poem it's one that i will enjoy going back to and reading again continuing to gain more clarity on it yeah that's a lot the of heart no, the, go on. the heart swimming i mean this is what i mean by like the fluttering and then the fading <clears throat> and we're you know there's a bunch of stories and pop culture and movies about the initial fluttering the initial infatuation 
And I think a lot of people take what everything is supposed to be from those stories, those fictional things. And then we just get like, I don't know, we get too caught up in that. Yeah. This is what it's supposed to be and it's not being that. So, you know, I don't know. Honestly, the more we try to dissect this, the more I'm kind of fading away from this poem, but still. <clears throat> the more I dissect things, the more I usually become interested in them. I feel like in other places in this book, I feel frustrated when it moves, like it moves very associatively. And that happens in a lot of poems where you have to like track the little threads from earlier in the poem and really like pull them apart. And sometimes that means looking up whatever fucking vocabulary the poet uses that refers to the part of the ship. Like, I don't know parts of a ship, but there's a lot of that. Um, or looking up, you know, a reference to that one with the boxer more denies Holyfield in 12. That you had to explain was about boxing. Well, yeah. not about boxing, but referring to boxing. Referring to that specific event, which I believe was at the end of Holyfield's career. This was after the Mike Tyson incident. You, do, you don't know that, though? No. Mike Tyson and Holyfield were fighting, and Tyson was losing, even though he was expected to win, and he was so desperate that he bit his ear off. Like, oh, that's like shit. The famous, okay, that's what that's uh, about. Okay. Well, that's not what this I've poem like, is about. I mean... That's not what that poem is about, but, like, that's the famous Mike. That's basically Tyson's claim to fame. Mike. Other than here. being, you know, a great, one of the best boxers to ever live, that's like his big I guess big I just mix him up with Ozzy Osbourne sometimes. That and then his They're tattoo on the face and he had like a huge breakdown. Yeah. It became a joke in The Hangover like 10 years later, but like when that happened, it was like, what the fuck is going on with Mike Tyson? But yeah, I don't know. Did you want to talk about that boxing one? That's way back in the beginning. Not really. I struggled yeah. with this one. Yeah. Yeah, and then the first line is Caesar's Palace. I'm a Vegas person, so I know what yeah. that is. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's a lot of beating up, right? One minute you're talking weather, then a nasty left right in the second round. Yeah, I just get a sense of like an aging father in this one. There, that's sort of what I was reading into it. I don't know if that was like wrong or if I made that up, actually. Let me open it up again. There are definitely other poems I liked more than this poem. Yeah. So when Mike Tyson has this line of weed gummies now that are shaped like an ear, but a piece of it's yeah. missing because he bit off that piece of Holyfield's ear. Yeah. No. My father getting out of the car. I'm squinting. His shirt is that bright. I was stunned for a minute, but was able to clear my head. I think that's a direct line. Yeah, from what? I think from one of the uh, actual like the interviews, yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't, yeah, I didn't watch any interviews. Yeah, boxing Just is. I'm not a big boxing looked up guy. The fight. Yeah, I don't know I, a lot about boxing, but I like a few sports. And then if you like a few sports, you just get the gist of like the overall. You know. Yeah, I don't. I'm not know a big baseball guy, but I know who Mickey Mantle is and who he played for and when. You know that kind of thing. But I don't really like baseball, but. I still know that just by, like, default, being, like, an American man <laughs> that, like, grew up in uh, America. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, everybody's dad was really into baseball or whatever. Yeah, this just feels like a poem about losing your father. And I think more, this this fight, I don't know enough about it, so correct us listeners if we're wrong here, but uh, <clears throat> I believe Holyfield was expected to win and more upset him, which is why the... Uh, it became like more of a famous fight or it's a fight mm -hmm. she was watching with her dad or whatever. It was a big fight. Cause Holyfield was a huge boxer. Yeah. This one ends. Well, you have that line because my father used to be two men, but now he's old. And then at the end, but suddenly I'm going down saying I've been holding on with my teeth. I've developed this strange social stutter. I had to let my cutman go. I struggled with what to make of this one. I, I feel like I've said that for everything. I feel like I say that for every fucking poem we talk about. I struggle to make it. But 
but um, Cupman, I'm not sure, but I think that might be referred to as what. Um, it's the person who prevents. Who, who like stands in the corner is supposed to like right. treat injury or prevent injury or yeah well because when you get hit in the face right that famous scene in rocky where he's got that swollen black eye he can't see out of it so sure, they had to didn't watch they, it yeah well they take a razor blade and they still do i don't know if they still do this but back then they did and they would slight slice right above the eye to relieve the pressure oh, so he could yeah. open it again and keep fighting type thing so they usually Gross. do that, and then they'll, like, let it bleed a little bit and then, you know, put some Vaseline or something over it. I think, you know, UFC and stuff like that is similar. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not a big UFC person either, but... Yeah, fighting is fucking brutal, man. You get pretty... I have no desire. <laughs> no desire to get into a fight, but... Cut man or whatever, yeah. I don't know. Anything else you want to hit on? I think we hit. I hit everything I wanted to. I hate the line with Bob Marley taking that one long drag on the refrigerator door. Oh, yeah. In the poem right know. before. I, like, am I... <laughs> I don't know. I didn't love it. But I do like this book. I want to reread it. I don't know. I feel like I repeat myself a lot when we talk about poems. And say, I just I don't know. I'm not sure. I just had this feeling. It feels like this. You know why you hate that Bob Marley line? Yeah, just because it's like fucking annoying. Yeah, exactly. It's this. This is dorm room pictures. Bob Marley hitting the J. You know, whatever. And this is where. You know, that. Uh, I don't know when Bob Marley, I guess he was always the counterculture, but then like in our generation and stuff, maybe it was the generation before where he became like this kind of countercultural symbol that like wasn't countercultural anymore because it was just so commercialized and main, you know, kind of thing. Go into Walmart and see Bob Marley on like a blanket, like a throw oh, yeah. blanket or, you know, like that was a little later than this probably too, but. I mean, that yeah. shit's still around. It's yeah, still it's still around. around because that's what I mean. It's become like a commercialized symbol of this kind of like it, what was countercultural when he was doing it at the time before he died and then you know starting that kind of not just musical revolution but kind of a cultural kind of like countercultural kind of revolution that Bar Marley was the face of it became you know it just became a kind of a commercialized symbol now so you can get it on t-shirts in like Target and all that and having a picture of Bob Marley hitting a joint on your fridge I mean that was in almost every dorm room I went into for a party you know but yeah, we good. We done with this. Yeah, I mean, fun little book, kind of long, but fast read. I wanted to spend more time reading it. I still kind of want to spend more time reading it. Again, I fucking say this about every book of poems. I feel like I'm never spending enough time with it, and then I say some dumb shit. But yeah, yeah, I like this book. Um, I like Olina. Like, I like her work. Dude, we should get her on the pod, dude. I mean, she's great. I feel like she's also, like, insane smart. Like, crazy smart. Like, very well-read. She's a Has lawyer. that kind of yeah. just a biting intellect that kind of horrifies me. Yeah. So, the la she doesn't really do interviews, but if anybody knows her, we'd like to get her on the but pod yeah, and I talk love poems. Her. I think she is definitely We're, one of my favorite yeah. poets. Same. Um, like I said I have tattooed of her one book. Five. But like, uh, yeah, and she doesn't give a lot of interviews. I've emailed her for interviews before when mm -hmm. I was running lit mags and Me stuff. Too. I know Sophie has too. Yeah. And she's just one of those that just doesn't mysterious character. Yeah, I just it. doesn't respond because she doesn't have to, and just. Yeah, no, I've asked you. Yeah, I, I just I'd like to get her on here and do like a talk or something. That I think that would be a lot of fun. And I mean, Sophie and I are fangirls of her, so like we said, we'd like to have Alina. Uh, if anybody out there will uh, get us in contact, yeah, I mean, be appreciated. Really phenomenal. Looking forward to getting her newest book that I guess came out in twenty two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I saw. Yeah. 
And I will. I haven't been. I haven't gotten it yet, but I will because I buy everything she writes because she's again one of the best living poets. Her and Nick Flynn are like the two that I'm like, oh, I don't even care what it is, what it's about, what the theme is. I'm gonna buy it. Like I'm gonna buy that book and read it. Maybe it'll be great, but maybe it'll be terrible. Usually, if it's not great, it's just okay anyway. But like you know, I respect those two writers, those two poets living in a. I guess she's an American poet, even though she's like a Ukrainian American. I would call her American because. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's it. We done here? Uh, fucking, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're done. done. Yeah. Let's be done. Yeah. All right. Uh, reminder to listeners, we're still looking for workshop horror stories. If you have a workshop horror story you want to share with us, please send that to heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. You can contact us there as well. We like hearing from our listeners. Uh, we also have a subscription plan. You can subscribe to this pad. You can subscribe to this podcast at patreon.com slash heavy board. We receive full uncensored episodes for subscribers only. That includes bonus episodes, Q and A's that Sophie and I do whenever we get a couple questions thought in. Uh, if you don't want to do that, can't afford that, there are other ways to support us. You can leave us a five-star review on Apple. That helps us out, helps us grow. Free way to support us. We appreciate it. Uh, you can also check out and subscribe to our YouTube channels. Uh, that helps us out. We usually have all of our free episodes up there as well as clips. If you don't have time to listen to the whole episode, check it out. Give us a subscribe, a like, a share. It helps us. Of course, everything we covered, including links to the books, is in the description. And next episode, we are doing uh, Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Oh, we didn't talk about this one, but go read Resolutions in a Parked Car from the book that we just talked about today. It's a really good one. Again, I think it hits on all the themes and it's a good way to help you understand the book. This has been Heavy Board. See ya. I am heavy, heavy, heavy board. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.